We are all motivated by meaning, which is why the reInvent podcast aims to bring you a wide range of relevant information, focusing on all aspects of physical, mental, and spiritual well-being. The objective of this show is to pick the minds of some of the most interesting people, all with their own stories of personal transformation, so that you can make the changes towards a more meaningful, healthier, and happier life. My name is Nikki Robertson. I'm a clinical nutritionist, NLP practitioner, and founder of reInvent Health. Necessity, as we know, is the mother of invention. Never was this more true than in the current state we're finding ourselves in. The COVID pandemic has sped up the progression of many areas of tech, from virtual conferencing to the way we communicate with our doctors. Telemedicine encompasses not only virtual medical consultations, but extends to wearables, apps, and even remote surgery, making healthcare more accessible and proactive. In this episode, I chat with Neil Kinsley of Medici South Africa and Dion Burrs, Global Group Executive of Operations at Spesnet Global about the future of virtual healthcare. Telemedicine isn't just about talking to a doctor by Zoom. It's been around for a couple of years. It's a way of collecting and managing patient data in a way that enables a doctor to quickly access patient history, probably gain a better insight into things that a patient may or may not disclose because they don't know that telling their doctor that some other doctor put them on a certain medication that contraindicates their painkillers. Uh, and we see this a lot. Um, mm. So, you know, in the, in the last couple of weeks or months, uh, patients and doctors have got more accustomed to uh, a consult, a virtual consult, which until now has been something that has probably been very difficult to bring into public awareness. What are your thoughts around that? Okay. So, I mean, yeah, you're, you're hundred percent right. Um, I mean, I think it's really been, uh, it's been put on, you know, under a spotlight within the last uh, sort of month or two, and the idea of a virtual consultation has become a lot more attractive because, I mean, there's a, there's a convenience element to it, obviously, but the pure fact that you're able to get care from your practitioner um, without potentially leaving your house is a very attractive one. But, you know, and the reality is, is that it's actually been happening for quite a long time. Um, and I, and I've, I say this quite often is that, uh, you know, consultations or tele, telemedicine, uh, virtual medicine, um, is as old as the telephone because it's not uncommon for doctors to be, you know, they, their patients reach out to them all the time on email or on SMS or WhatsApp, etc. And these are all forms of, of telemedicine. It, it is extending care um, over a remote distance, you know, where both patient and doctor are not in the same place. I think it's really just in the last two months or so where, you know, more and more doctors have started to use it. Um, they're inviting their patients to use it and it's really working, you know, for everybody. And I think it's, you know, as patients realize that it's just become so much more convenient, they're able to get that, that care without exposing themselves to a doctor's uh, consulting room. It's a very attractive idea. Yes. So let's go back a step and um, how did you get involved in, in this line of work? What drove you into this, this what's becoming the new normal? Um, I hate using that terminology, but it really is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, it is. You're right, it is the, the new normal. Um, I, was, I was actually working for Discovery for, for many years. Um, and, at, and at some point in my career with Discovery, I was shipped off to Chicago um, to support the sales and marketing team in our efforts to bring discovery and the vitality program into Chicago, into the state of Illinois. Wow. And while I was there, um, I happened to meet a chiropractor and an insurance broker. I mean, just, you know, <laughs> this is how, that's how it worked out. <laughs> and many, many, many years, you know, we just, we just kept, kept in contact. And many years later, when um, I was looking for an alternative, uh, the chiropractor is our CEO in the US and the insurance broker was our global development uh, manager. And they reached out to me and they said to me, um, you know, you've been in healthcare, you understand healthcare financing, you understand the challenges of extending care, why don't you come across? And it's, and you know, I've been doing it now for just over three years and I mean, it's been amazing because I have seen how telemedicine has completely transformed some practices. 
Um, I've met doctors. I've met a, a, a psychiatrist um, who, who runs a 100% virtual practice. Yes. Um, I've seen practitioners turn their practice into a 50% virtual practice within a couple of weeks. I've seen practitioners over the last two months have no interruption to their remuneration or revenue at all because of the fact that they used virtual care. So it's been, a, it's been an amazing and an extremely exciting ride. But that's pretty much how I got into it. And, um, and Dion, what is your story behind this new tech? <laughs> so, so my story dates back. I'm a, I'm a physiotherapist by training and qualified. Um, and, uh, you know, I've been involved in healthcare, all the various aspects of healthcare over many years, um, working in the state, working in private sector, uh, working in South Africa, working in the UK. Um, I was the president of the Physio Society at a stage as well. And, uh, and then also, it's funny how all roads tend to lead to a similar place. Um, I did consult to Discovery Health as well, as well as the CSRR. Um, and, and that kind of gave a really nice sort of 360, 360 view of healthcare um, and all the different challenges that we face, whether you're the administrator, the scheme, uh, the provider, the patient. Um, and, and so that gave an interesting view. And, and we kind of stepped into uh, developing uh, ProfNet Medical. Um, as a service uh, to allied healthcare professionals, uh, those, those healthcare professionals uh, other than the doctors and the dentists, um, to kind of address common challenges and common opportunities. And we did that in collaboration with the SpaceNet group uh, that's been around since 2002. And so ProfNet forms uh, one, of the, one of the sister companies within the stable, um, providing technology solutions to the, to the healthcare environment, both in private and in public. Um, and we've expanded even into the, the global space of Southeast Asia and the US. Um, and it's with that kind of platform that we looked at constantly advancing our systems to help the, the, the practitioner on the ground. Um, we, we developed EasyMed, which is a practice management application or practice management system uh, two and a half years ago. Um, and that went into market um, uh, catering for, for, for healthcare practitioners on a, on a modern technology platform, um, being fully mobile, uh, being intelligent and being easy to use. And uh, as we've looked at EasyMed and rolling that out into the market, um, obviously technology is uh, enhancing at a rapid rate, um, I think faster than people can adapt to it. And uh, the COVID crisis has been a catalyst, I think, in, in, in shaping people's behavior, whether you're the patient or the, or the healthcare provider yeah, absolutely. In, in embracing technology, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So it's, it's with that that we kind of uh, crossed paths with Medici and, and with Neil and said, listen, we've got a great product, you've got a great product. Uh, putting the two together will really uh, uh, bring to the healthcare market what is needed as far as uh, bringing telehealth uh, into the hands of the healthcare provider and making it as easy as possible for the patients to engage. So how challenging has it been, firstly, to get, say, the medical aid schemes, uh, the professional councils and governing bodies, to, to pay for consultations that are not in person in the sort of the absence of a, of a physical examination. I know that there's a lot of red tape, um, mm -hmm. with, you know, and bureaucracy around these things. And it seems yeah. that with COVID, the adoption of this was almost taken out of their, they couldn't say no because they had to suddenly up the game. What, what is, what's your experience been around that? Um, I think I think Neil can come in quite strongly on the on the pre-COVID times and the experience uh, that led us up to that point. But I think one of the major catalysts that have moved us into the space we find ourselves now um, is the the regulatory councils um, uh, reviewing their their position on telemedicine or telehealth um, uh, in the face of COVID. Um, on how do we actually reach out and continue to service the patients and uh, do all the screenings required to direct the patients into the right health facilities and. Uh, Telehealth is an obvious solution to that, to that challenge. So we found that both the Health Professions Council as well as the Allied Health Professions Council as well as the Social Work Council um, have, have stepped up and said we have to rapidly relook at our regulation. Um, that has been quite uh, uh, restrictive to, to what can be provided by healthcare providers um, and allowing contact the first phase really from the Health Professions Council was let's engage with telehealth to, to, to current patients and then the second, second step was taken to in fact say you know, even new patients to the practice uh, can engage with the healthcare providers. So, um, so, so they came to the party and the regulation has changed to, to cater for the current COVID crisis. But we do believe that post-COVID they will review their, their, their position rather than just click the reset button. And we look forward to seeing what that, uh, that new regulatory framework will look like. What I should mention as well is that I think, I think there's a perception that um, it's really only 
uh, with COVID that the, the medical aides have been paying for virtual consults. Actually, not really the case. Um, mm. Some of the more forward-thinking uh, medical aides were paying for virtual care probably two years ago at least. Um, and we saw the, the larger ones like Discovery, for example, they brought out an offering. Um, uh, uh, BankNet you know, did something very similar. MMI did something very similar. ProfMeds did something. So, so there have actually been a couple of medical aides that have already introduced uh, virtual care into their benefit schedule. It's just, I think, that um, there was a lot more clarity around how much would be reimbursed. Obviously, the reimbursement rates also increased, which was great for practitioners. There was a stack more clarity around coding and which codes to use. And as Dion correctly said, I mean, we saw literally, you know, within a two or three week period, we had a change in legislation that may have probably taken us years yeah. to, to mm-hmm. achieve. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm with him on it. I think there's certainly going to be a relook at the, those regulations. Um, I don't think we're going to have a reset, but I think we're going to have a look at uh, what those regulations may look like after COVID. But right now, the reality is that virtual care and telemedicine is is playing a vital role in extending care. And um, it's pretty much the solution to social distancing. Yes, it is. And also in a country like ours, where we've got people who live in such far-flung areas that don't have access to quality medical care, and, you know, your, your overheads as a, as a practitioner are so much lower uh, when you're providing a, 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 a virtual service that you can, in the same space, provide really good quality care or at least advice, first-line first, first line therapy to people who may not otherwise have access to medicine. Absolutely. And, you know, that was probably one of our driving factors around creating Medici. Um, we watched for years as... The practice of medicine just became more complex. Uh, you know, there's regulation, there's medical aid um, requirements, there's a regulatory requirements, there's all sorts of things that just really bog a, a practitioner down on a daily basis. Um, we watched as well as, you know, it's easy for people to WhatsApp each other and use SMS and email. And it's, you know, even in COVID, right? I mean, we, people were Zooming and Skyping and they were, you know, they were communicating all the time. And consumers were were reaching out to their doctors all the time um, and that's one of the driving factors around uh, you know behind Medici is that in a country like ours where you have two things one is language very often and the other one is a geographical barrier um, to access to primary health care we were very confident that we could solve for both of those problems and we believe in, in Medici we have exactly done that Mm. You know, I think yes. if I can if I can complement and add into that is, um, it's not only about the accessibility and affordability of care and being able to reach out to your healthcare practitioner at your convenience and the convenience of the healthcare provider, but what I, I've really been encouraged by is that um, uh, prior to to, to our, our, our state of disaster, um, I think a lot of the focus and benefit was geared to the general practitioner. Um, and services from the GP to the patients and to um, uh, uh, nurses in, in remote areas um, from a benefit point of view in the medical schemes and, and so on. Um, but what's really been encouraging for me is how that's opened up to the other healthcare providers within the um, holistic team uh, taking care of the patient. And so, you know, we're seeing, we're seeing more and more schemes coming on board and supporting uh, telehealth or telemedicine strategies um, for various healthcare providers. And if you, if you think of the journey, for example, of a diabetic patient, um, they'll be consulting their GP, their endocrinologist. Um, but complementing that team is uh, the likes of podiatry, biokinetics, physiotherapy, dietitians. And that all gives that holistic view, the, 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 the nurse, um, to actually manage the patient holistically in a multidisciplinary or probably even better an interdisciplinary approach. And, um, and I think that's quite important that, that the telehealth platforms allow for that and enable that and empower that um, in the way that, that Medici and EasyMed do. Yeah, sure. Ex- I mean, expanding the knowledge base is the one thing that really stands out for me. When there's no more operating in a confined environment. The information is now out there and what practitioners are learning on the ground now with all of this available to them is it's quite profound that, you know, the difference between traditional practice. 100%. I mean, previously, if you wanted to get a multidisciplinary team around a patient, um, it was typically a bricks and mortar consideration about the facility that the, the practice is running from. Um, but now you can bring in virtual uh, network of providers and teams uh, from various places around the country, around the world even, 
um, to bring them in and actually consult and bring the best, uh, the best of, of breed to the patient in, in managing their, their complex conditions. Um, because very seldom is it, is it an isolated condition, but uh, uh, you might have diabetes that's further complicated by obesity or hypertension and so on. So you need that, that team of healthcare providers to, to provide that support, not only to each other as far as second opinions and so on goes, but uh, obviously directed at the patient. Yeah. So patients are um, nowadays quite happy to consult with Dr. Google and get onto a, a forum and discuss their, their ailments quite openly and take advice from not very professional you know, opinions. You can go into any Facebook page and Google whatever you're suffering from and get all sorts of advice, but not from doctors. And they're quite happy to go with that advice. So I don't think it's the patients who, who have got a problem with embracing technology around medicine, but the doctors is another question because as a, you know, a doctor is trained to diagnose via physical examination and by Zoom, you can't really do that. You can't look down someone's throat or, or, or check their eardrum um, via Zoom. So what has been the response from doctors, generally speaking? Yeah, I mean, you're 100% right. Um, you know, and I think one thing is, is, is very clear is that virtual care will never replace an in-office face-to-face consult. Um, you know, that's always going to be the primary extension of care and, you know, uh, it'll never replace that. Um, and it's quite interesting, you know, I, you know, intuitively, you would almost think that it would be the younger doctor, um, the more tech savvy kind of doctor, I think, because oh. um, that's what you sort of think, and the, you know, you would think that those, the younger doctor might soon have jump onto this, and, but we actually find that some of our, our most frequent users are actually more um, elderly doctors, um, and I think it's because they've, I think they've just got more experience maybe. Um, I don't exactly know what the real reason is. But um, we find that the, the take-up has been phenomenal. Um, and I think, you know, honestly, we're not actually asking them to do anything that they haven't been doing forever. So sure. All we're saying is that you have been doing this already. We are offering you a platform that is, number one, secure. Number two, um, does have a revenue opportunity opportunity if it's appropriate. Number three, keeps, keeps a record, an electronic health record, allows you to attach photographs, etc., whatever it may be, um, and, and allows you to extend virtual care on your terms. So it's not that different to what they're already doing, actually. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think uh, Nikki, that the, the challenge is that um, uh, how, how does one bring that all together into that electronic health record or into one central professional platform? Uh, as Neil alluded to earlier, um, doctors, healthcare practitioners are engaging with their patients using various platforms. Um, I know of psychologists that, that might use uh, a Skype for a consultation, um, use WhatsApp for another ch channel of communication, use SMS to schedule appointments and to, to report back on symptoms, for example, yeah. um, use emails. Um, so you end up with a myriad of, of technology platforms that one can use to engage with your patients. And trust me, I think right from young to old doctors and patients alike are, are engaging on those platforms. But I think there's, a, there's an inner danger in that, in the fragmentation of those communication channels, um, in being accountable to communications, uh, reports, um, opinions that have been given through these various channels, that if you hold accountable by your regulator, for example, the HPCSA calling on uh, uh, evidence or information relating to an intervention with a patient uh, two or three years later. The challenge is always where do you find that information? Because you can't quite remember how did I communicate to this patient? I yeah. checked my emails, checked my SMSs. And there's a, there's a danger in that. In um, Firstly, the patients are, are communicating with you on your personal cell phone and there's also that, that there isn't that separation of professional patient uh, uh, channels and relationship. Um, but secondly, having it all in one place to have a continued clinical note process um, to, 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 to manage all of that and, and populate that into electronic health record um, so that you can actually see. I SMSed the patient on that day. They responded back to me by WhatsApp. Yeah, I did a telehealth consultation where I actually observed, looked at the photograph, looked at the video, um, I found the following and recommended the following and then had a contact session with that patient. So that, that history, that whole timeline about the journey uh, 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 of the contact between the patient and the, and the practitioner, the healthcare practitioner, I think is very important. Um, and, and in su such a way that uh, th we, we've solved for that in such an eloquent way within uh, EasyMed and, and integrated with Medici 
that we've in fact got underwriters uh, who have acknowledged that uh, management of that in, in line with the Health Professions Council's regulations um, and, and discounted excess uh, fees uh, that are typically applicable in the telehealth space. So I think that's quite a strong testament to the importance of having a central record of all those communications um, and having evidence of the actual interaction that did take place that may or may not be built for. Yeah, that's, that's critical. So going forward, I mean, we've seen recently how this has just skyrocketed because of, of a crisis, but where are we going in the future? We've seen so many advances as far in, in sort of wearables are concerned. Um, we've heard stories of people wearing um, devices that have warned them that they're, they have got a regular heart uh, beat, so they go and get checked out and manage to avoid um, a heart attack, for example. There's so much happening in the world of tech. How would you, do you foresee this all being integrated again into uh, as one platform where you've got all of these checks and balances in place and all this information is quite a, it's quite a job to push this all through one, one central way of managing things. Yeah, it is. But, and you know, it's moving so quickly. And that's what also the, the that's the, also the, the biggest challenge because the tech is moving so quickly that, you know, what was out last month is all, almost old news. Um, and, and, you know, the, the wearable devices, etc. cetera, uh, you know, that's been around for quite a long time already. And um, if you just look at what Apple and Google are doing, uh, just to, just to bring those sort of technological advances into the clinical world, you know, by the end of this year, we're going to be seeing some amazing things. But, you know, Nikki, you made a really good point just now. You said um, we've seen patients that use WebMD and Google Doc all the time. They're quite happy to do that. Yeah. And if you ask them, why did you not do that with your doctor? They'll say, well, my doctor wasn't available virtually. Right. That's what they've been turning to. So I think that with more and more doctors going onto a virtual platform, I think we're going to see a lot more um, less reliant on, you know, less patients reliant on WebMD and and uh, and Googling themselves and their, and their ailments and rather, and, you know, we've said this a few times, I think um, it's going to be difficult to put the genie back into the bottle because um, doctors have already seen the power of, of virtual care. Um, patients have experienced it. And I think uh, we'll see what happens with regulations, but as long as regulations are, still friendly, I, I think we're going to see, this is just going to be, I think we're beyond the question of, is telemedicine going to be around post COVID? I think the question more so is, which platform will you use and how will you use this in the most efficient and effective way in your practice? Mm. So one other question that just comes to mind is that there are people who are worried about disclosing their information especially to a large organization like a medical aid, because they're afraid that if they disclose um, anything untoward, it could uh, affect their insurance premiums or they could be um, refused, um, you know, a service further on down the line. What are the checks and balances in place that stop that from happening, that this information is for the doctor and it's not to be used by an insurance company, for example? Yeah, absolutely. You're 100% right. And it, and it is one of the fears that a patient has, you know, what is going to be happening, you know, what happens with my private clinical data. And that's why it is so important. And it's something that um, uh, Dion and I have been on about um, on, on our webinars in the last couple of weeks. And that is the platform or the solution that is chosen by the practitioner needs to be secure, needs to be compliant, you need to know where that data is held and who has access to that data because you want to be able to give peace of mind to the patient that, you know, that the confidentiality of the data between the patient and the practitioner is sacred. And, yes. you know, you need to give that, that peace of mind. And it's absolutely one of the critical elements that a practitioner needs to take into account when choosing a platform. Okay. What, we've, what we've done, Nikki, I think, and, and that is important, is that the, the clinical notes, what we do is we combine the, the notes uh, taken within the Medici platform and obviously the notes that the practitioner does within their practice management system um, and combine those into the, into the patient healthcare record. Um, and, and it's always a, a, a contentious point about who does that information belong to. Um, obviously, the patient's details and information is protected under the Poppy Act and we need to ensure that that is protected in, 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 the, in the correct manner. 
Um, but second to that, there are notes and, and uh, uh, conversations that I had where the healthcare provider requires that information in the management of the patient. And sometimes that information is not even, uh, the patient's not even privy to that because that information may be used in such a way to protect the patient, for example, in psychology assessments and so on. Yes. Um, but that information must be secured and available to the practitioner so that should there ever be a point that they are held accountable or called in front of their, their, their regulator or in a forensic audit review type of environment or even the patient asking for information after the fact that there's a proper and robust set of information that the practitioner can then reference, remind themselves of the interactions that, that in fact take place, and then either report off of those notes or if it's subpoenaed, actually submit those notes forward into a, a court of law. Um, but it is important that we respect the patient's um, uh, uh, privacy in that and that this information isn't just standardly submitted through to a medical scheme um, if it's not in the process of actually securing funding and payment for that intervention. Um, so it must be appropriate sharing of that information and not just a, a broad blanket sharing. Yes, yeah, I think that's the biggest hurdle in the minds of the doctor and the patient is how will this all be handled and who has access to it. I think that's probably, look, for me, that would be my, my big question. Mm -hmm. Um, as a practitioner, how would I get to find out about your products, what you can do for my practice and the training involved? Sure. So I think um, there's, there's a couple of ways. I think the, the, the first one is um, to find out more relating specifically to the EasyMed and Medici solution that we have. Um, we do have a, 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 a website that can be accessed. It's uh, medicimed.co.za. Uh, Medici is M-E-D-I-C-I, -I, uh, M-E-D.co.za. Um, we do have easymeds.solutions as a website as well, which is also directed from there, and then medici.md. Um, so those are the various platforms you can go and access to find out more um, uh, about the various products and how they work together. And then, as you said, you've got weekly webinars, and those answer all sorts and kinds of questions that a practitioner would have. Do you have anything available for, for patients who are wanting to find out, um, you know, address any of their questions or concerns? Um, I think um, Neil, Neil can answer just a bit around the patients and their interest in what that platform looks like and, and how that's catered specifically for them. Um, but I think just as far as the webinars themselves go, um, we are running a series of webinars every Thursday at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, um, and we'll be running that for, for, the, for, the, for the medium term, um, where we've actually created quite a relaxed, informal environment um, where we have different panelists coming on um, and speaking about telehealth and other challenges in private practice. Um, and this was really birthed off um, multiple phone calls that I'd received from healthcare providers that are in fact feeling through this, this COVID uh, crisis are feeling quite isolated um, and not really sure what they can and can't do. And they're really reaching out for um, a conversation with uh, other healthcare providers uh, to try and assist and navigate the complexity that we find ourselves in. There are so many questions. Sure. Um, sure. And uh, we found um, uh, we've had to lift our, our caps on those webinars um, to cater for up to a thousand delegates. Um, wow. because of the, the massive interest. And uh, uh, we've also had a, a, a request for, for demoing the actual system live to actually, so that practitioners can see exactly what that looks like, which we'll be doing tomorrow, uh, Tuesday the 2nd of June, um, uh, from 4 to 5 as well. So, so I think that's, that's, that's exciting platforms that we're not just speaking to the, the healthcare professionals out there, but taking questions um, and assisting those, que those questions then assist us in guiding the next uh, programs that we'll be rolling out. But that's all listed on our um, EasyMed.Solutions website um, for the webinars that are taking place. Okay. Yeah. yeah, so I was just going to just, just go into that point about patients. I mean, so patients really get to Medici um, because they have been navigated there by their doctors. Um, generally, I'll tell you one thing about, about telemedicine as well, and this we, we know well, and that is um, uh, patients actually want to speak to their own doctor. They don't necessarily want to speak to any doctor. And that's why you find with the, once the practitioner has chosen um, Medici as a platform, they tend to then you know, bring their patients in. And we've got a couple of support mechanisms to assist. So um, the, for us, it is around getting the practitioner on first. And, and ultimately, Medici is a tool for practitioners. It's used by patients, but the features within Medici are all around how do we make the work-life balance of the practitioner better. So once the practitioner has chosen Medici, they tend to bring the patients in. I think second to that also, Nikki, is that the, the patients have a dedicated, um, they navigate it in a very simple way um, through their, their, their diary appointments with a practice where they, they get a reminder of the, of, the, of, the, of the consultation 
Um, together with a deep link that automatically by clicking that on their phones will actually navigate them to download the, the Medici patient app, um, which is very specifically focused at the patient experience to keep that as simple um, and as easy to use as possible. And then automatically links that patient with their healthcare provider that's in fact set up that, that uh, scheduled session with them uh, for the teleconsultation. Um, so from there, it becomes a very simple process to navigate through, um, uh, allowing them to, to continue in everything that they are used to through normal face-to-face -face, uh, consultations, uh, being that the medical aid details are already up with the provider, um, the uh, claims are sent through to the medical scheme in the normal fashion, um, and, and so the, the only variable here is that rather than coming into the practice, uh, they have another place of service as, as such, being the, the comfort of their own home, um, engaging with the practitioner that they do know, um, and that's often in, in, in examples like follow-ups and just checking on the patient to be sure they're okay. Yes. Do they really need to come in for that follow-up assessment or can that be done through telehealth? So it's that additional convenient layer that's added into the, the existing patient uh, uh, provider relationship and even those new patients to the practice. Okay, this is brilliant. It's so promising. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I would say we, we are sort of heading for launch on, on the future of medicine, and this is it's a very exciting space to be in if we can get our heads around this, the pace um, at which this is all taking off. But I think this is true for all industries at the moment. We've got to, we've got to just tread water and keep up, um, mm -hmm. and it will make life easier in the long term. Um, you know, convinced of that. So thank you so much for your time. Um, I wish you all the best luck with, uh, with, with your product and getting it out there. And let's just hope that the, the, the legislation is, will stay in favor, all the bureaucracy will stay in favor of, of making sure that this grows. And I don't see why not. Thank you, Nikki. And thanks for the opportunity to, to, to discuss this with you and to share our excitement in, in how we are changing and shaping the landscape of healthcare going forward. Very exciting. So yes, thank you so much for your time again.